So thanks for coming here, Stefano, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Guanya. I realize that this is a profile that probably was on my website, which is about 20 years old, but somehow it's still relevant. I'm still trying to understand how machines interact naturally with the environment. And so <clears throat> thanks for the invite. It's a great pleasure to be back, uh, even though in this uh, remote setting. So this uh, control meets learning is a topic that has fascinated me for a while. And uh, uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the work of many collaborators. Uh, too many to list, but in particular, uh, many of the ideas that you will see described today are really the uh, the main drivers of those are three students, former students of mine, Alessandro Achille, who is now an applied scientist at AWS, Pratik Chaudhary, who is an assistant professor at UPenn, and Aditya Golatkar, who is a, still a student, a third year student at UCLA. So <clears throat> when we talk about control and learning, we often think about how to learn how to control. And so uh, that's uh, a topic of great interest and great renewed interest. And you have a lot of people in this locale that are experts as that, and even previous uh, seminar speakers in the series. Uh, and you, know, you have people like uh, Yisong Nyu, and Imanan Kumar, and, and uh, uh, Aaron. So, uh, but what I would like to talk today is not so much how to navigate a robot through physical space from going from A to B, but rather, how to control the learning process itself. And uh, in particular, I will think of this process as an abstraction of the control process in physical space as we are trying to control the learning process, which is a gigantic beast that once formalized live in this very high dimensional space through the space of learning tasks. So it's really a navigation goal <clears throat> uh, in the space of learning tasks. Uh, sorry, uh, so excuse I, me, uh, Professor. Uh, part of your slides are cut off. The, the left part hmm. is, is a cut off a little bit. Oh, yeah, it's perfect right now. Thanks. Interesting. OK. Can you see it uh, fully now? OK. I don't see the chat, uh, but uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. So come on audio and, and uh, shout out. OK, so uh, as I try to uh, explain the process of controlling the learning process, which is to navigate through the space of learning task, which is what we try to do when we learn how to learn or we meta learn, uh, I would need to introduce some new concepts. And these are uh, concepts that we've been developing over the past uh, four to five years. So they were, will be new to most of you. So the first is a notion of task reachability, uh, which pertains to whether or not you are able to accomplish a learning task given where you're starting from uh, and how to solve it. And in order to do that, I will need to define what is the space of learning tasks, where do tasks live? And this is not your classical state space, uh, vector space of relatively low dimension. Uh, a lot of this will have to do with uh, deep neural networks, and you may have read in the news that these networks are now in the not tens, not hundreds of millions of parameters, but billions and tens of billions of parameters. <laughs> and so I will try to formalize the notion of the space of learning tasks and how to put a topology on it so we can compute distances between objects and paths from one task to the other. A key notion there is a notion of information because the process of learning is a process not of sourcing information, but, but um, digesting information in the data. And so I will introduce the concept of information Lagrangian that as written uh, may not seem new in the sense that it's very closely connected to the evidence lower bound, the information bottleneck, uh, the Kolmogorov structure functions, the notion of sufficient invariance for those of you who are familiar with those. So you will see many parallels. But the devil is in the details because beyond the expression, you need to be able to quantify this, these objects and, and uh, optimize them and even control them. Okay, so I will also point to relations between uh, some of the concepts that we introduce and biological phenomena that are so divorced from artificial neural networks that the fact that there are behavioral similarities or phenomenological parallels is kind of interesting. <clears throat> And finally, because this is uh, a, at least half <clears throat> a control audience, 
I'd like to point out to some very fertile area of exploration where the transient dynamics of learning are really very important and fascinating and strange. But also, once the transient is expanded, you end up in a regime where, as it turns out, you can linearize everything and uh, things miraculously work. And I'll introduce the notion of linear quadratic fine tuning, which is the latest development. So these are, you know, don't worry about if you don't understand all these terms. Uh, the purpose of this talk is to introduce, define, and describe these terms. Okay. Sounds like, um, okay. So if there's no uh, questions at this point, I'll, I'll get started. Again, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, this is a live event. I wish it was in person, but uh, but still, you know, it's live, so feel free to interrupt. Okay, so normally when we talk about learning, we think about uh, uh, a system. In this case, I'm indicating a control system where you feed some data. Uh, this could be time series or it could be images. And you try to predict some variable. Okay, this could be in the case of images, it could be the class you associate to an image, say cats and dogs and sailboats, or it could be a prediction of X itself in the future. It's any random variable you want. And then you have some ground truth samples for this output. And you try to, uh, and, and for the purpose of the stock, just to make things simple, okay, I will think of the output variable as just being an element of the discrete set. Okay, so for the purpose of illustration, I will just think of X being an image and Y being an element of a class which you can identify with real numbers from one to K, fine, okay? And just also for simplicity, I will assume that what's inside the box here has no memory, no dynamics, it's just a stateless function. It's a stateless operator that takes the input X and maps it to a predicted output Y. And so what you do then is you define some type of criterion uh, that measures the discrepancy between the predicted output and the real output. Let's call this a loss to be a reward if you take the negative of that. And then you try to do stuff to adjust the parameters of the model that's inside the blue box so that the predicted output matches in the sense defined by the loss, the ground truth output, okay? Then during inference time, after you're done with training, if you believe in this artificial separation of a training phase and then an inference phase, then there's no ground truth. You just feed a test input and you get the predicted output, okay? So um, now the way this process works is deceptively simple. You take some random initial condition and then you update the parameters of the model. I will talk to, uh, I will refer to them as weights because I will be talking about deep neural networks sitting inside this big box, which are just a general parametric function class, which is mon monstrously big and is a universal approximant. And you just update them with a very simple first order method where you take the gradient of this loss with respect to these millions or billions of parameters. And then you have some junk here. Junk literally means could be noise. And uh, uh, this, Iteration is defined by the loss, which typically is some function of some sort that measures the discrepancy between the true output and the predicted one, which obviously depends on the model parameters W. So this loss is a function of W, but also of the data set you use for training, which is uh, a function of N given samples. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what we do in deep learning. We take a gigantic parametric function class, we take a data set, and then we try, we define a loss function, and then we try this uh, very laborious uh, trial and error first order method. And what do we control as part of this process? Well, certainly we control the gain of the residual, call it the innovation if you wish. Uh, so this could be a scalar, could be a function. Okay, so we can certainly control that. We also control the stuff that we add to this process. Uh, so these could be literally in the form of noise. Now you may wonder why do you want to add noise? Uh, you'll see why. Noise is your friend actually here. And also we control the loss function, which could be adaptive, okay? And uh, that's the type of control that I will be talking about. But there's also another loop, which refers to the fact that you can actually influence the data acquisition process itself 
for instance, through data augmentation, or if truly there is a closed loop as in uh, active learning, where you select the subset of the data to annotate, or in active uh, sensor selection, where you select the type of sensors to query, or in active perception, where you control the data acquisition process through physical space, for instance, by moving the camera to explore and maximize visibility and whatnot. Just think of the mass rover uh, looking for stuff. Okay, so the control loop that I will be talking about is not this little one inside here, which is interesting by itself. Okay, it is going to be this one as well as this one. Okay, is that um, clear? So that's what I mean by saying control of learning. Okay, we are interested in controlling the learning process whereby the, param the parameters weight. W are updated so that we attain a certain goal. And what, what is that goal? Okay, so well, the goal is to solve a learning task. And what is a learning task? <laughs> right, so we need to define all these quantities. Okay, so let me start with the learning task um, because conceptually it's the simplest. So, what is a learning task? You can think, okay, the task is find cats and dogs in images. Okay, how do I formalize that? How do I tell an artificial system, go and find cats and dogs? Well, really, by giving the system a data set, okay, a training set. So you give the system examples of images with a label, cat, dog, sailboat, tree, uh, and so on. And that's all the system knows about the task. So in the simplest and most fundamental way for a learning system, the learning task is the training set, okay? I'll let you think about that for a second, but uh, you probably already can see that that's a problematic way of representing the learning task because if you gave me a different set of images of different cats and dogs, it's still the task of finding cats and dogs, but how do I compare these data sets? It could be different number of images with different dimensions. So how do I compare data sets? That's not a trivial thing to do. So keep in mind that the data set specifies the learning task, but it's not a workable representation of a learning task. Okay, now, after you're done training, however you do it, okay, whatever your loss, whatever your optimization function, whatever, all you're left with, uh, well, so of course, you first need to choose the optimization criterion, the learning criterion, right? And you could say, well, that defines my learning task because that's what I tell the network to do or the model to do, okay? And then I solve an optimization problem and then by definition, I'm optimal, okay? But if you choose a different loss and you're optimal with respect to that, who's right? Is your loss better than mine in what sense? There's no falsifiability criterion here, okay? So I would like to argue that there is a loss or a family of losses, which is the right loss. And this problem, as I understand, is felt in a number of areas that use learning. In fact, I watched Anka Dragon's very interesting uh, lecture in the series. And she was also mentioning about the intended task versus the, the instantiated task that you teach the robot. So what is the right criterion, if there is one? And then whatever your criterion is and whatever data set and whatever task, after you're done training, all you have left is the weights, the parameters of the model, okay? So whatever the task was, it is in the data set. And after you're done training, it must be in the weights. So whatever information means, which is a very tricky subject that I will explain, whatever that is, it's in the data set before you start training, and it is in the weights after you're done training. Okay? Any questions so far? So now you see why in the first picture where I talked about navigating in the space of tasks, I showed a visualization, a two-dimensional visualization of the residual surface of a deep network. This is work by Hao Li, uh, who's now at AWS. And uh, this is a contraction of a residual space that has the dimension of the number of parameters. So we are in the million dimensional spaces. And so that's the elephant I was mentioning in the abstract, navigating this elephant through the landscape of learning process. is exactly moving the system of millions of dimensions through this very high dimensional landscape so you can navigate from one task represented by a set of weights to a different task represented by a set of weights, okay? So now you hopefully we'll start to see the analogy and I'll make it precise. 
Okay. Okay, so um, as already mentioned, if we define a task as a data set, the problem is that we only have one data set. And for instance, if we see as the outcome of the learning process having accrued some information about the task, and that information was in the data set, the data set is one, it's fixed. There is no distribution of data sets. You get one. And so what is information even means? There is no entropy, you know, it's, uh, it's a general notion. After you're done training, the weights are also fixed. There you have one set of trained parameters. So what does it mean that the information is now in the weights? Okay. So uh, this has created a lot of confusion in uh, the field of representation learning where people try to define and measure information in deep networks. So uh, hopefully, this lecture will clear what that means. And it took us a while to uh, figure it out and formalize it. And typically the loss for classification, which is the task that I am gonna focus on today, is typically, uh, ideally, the expected cross entropy, which is the average with respect to the true distribution of the data, which you don't know, you don't have access to, of minus the log, of the model distribution of the data, which is parameterized, which is what you would like your model to learn, okay? So for those of you who are familiar, this is the notion of expected cross entropy. And it's just a function that if you are able to minimize, okay, one of the minimizer is the posterior distribution of the output given the input. Why is that good? Because the discriminant, the function that is most informative of the output given the input is the posterior distribution. And so if your model converges to that, then you're in business, okay? You have all the information about the task that the data contains, okay? Problem is you don't know the true distribution. You only have access to the data set, which is sampled from it. And so instead people minimize what's known as the empirical cross entropy, which is average over the data set as opposed to the true distribution. And that's just the empirical or the Monte Carlo approximation of the expected cross entropy. And there is the big problem that Anka Draga was talking about in a more general setting, but here in a very, very, very narrow setting, we have two tasks. We have the training task, which is the data set we're given. And then we have the test Task, which is future data we'll see in the future. And that is different in general. And in fact, it's so bad that the Bayesian discriminant, the optimum, the ideal thing you would like to find is actually not a minimizer of the loss you're minimizing. So this is a kind of the elephant in the room in, in machine learning where you start with a problem that has a desired outcome, and then you frame a loss function and that loss function by, by definition does not capture your desire because if you're able to minimize that, you get complete garbage. You get not the posterior distribution, but the train of delta center of the samples, which is the overfitting phenomenon that anybody who has played with these networks or any machine learning problem has witnessed, okay? So even in the very simplest case where both training data and future data come from the same distribution, there are still two different cohorts and in general, there are different tasks, and so you don't know how to go from one to the other. What does it mean to go from one to the other? How far is one from the other, okay? Okay. And then, of course, we may want to learn new tasks where we already know that the data is different from data we've seen in the past, and so in that case, the, we need to travel even farther. So really, the empirical loss is not the loss we care for to optimize. Okay, so before I move on to the part based bound, so any questions uh, up to this point? Okay, I gather that's clear. So, what I will try to do now is I will try to answer the first question, which is if the loss that we minimize in training a deep network is not the loss we really want to minimize then what is that loss that we would rather minimize or that we ought to minimize? Is there one? Is there one that is computable? Because we know that the expected cross entropy is the loss we would like to minimize, but we don't have 
the distribution and we don't have future data. Okay. Is there a function that is computable that if we minimize that, then we minimize the expected loss? So is that a bound? Okay. It's the first question I'll address today. So that bound is called the back based bound. Okay. I'll walk you through that. Some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. Okay. So here on the left, we have the uh, future, the, the, sorry, the expected loss. The expected loss is the loss on future data. Okay. That's the loss function we would love to minimize, but we don't have, to have access to future data. And this is instead the training set or the past data, which we have. And this is the empirical loss. And the data set has n samples. Okay. And so the pack based bound says the following it says, if you minimize the empirical error, average over the weights, I will come back to that in a second. And together, you minimize also this Kulbach Liebler divergent term, which measures the divergence between some distribution of the weight. Okay, now antennas should go up. What distribution of the weight? You told us that the weights are fixed. Yes, they are. So, but hold on a second. And some posterior distribution of the weights after I've seen the data set. Okay, then this is an upper bound on the expected loss, which is measures the gap between these two measures the generalization error. Okay, so now there are these two mysterious objects here. Okay which for a deep network, uh, P of W is uh, you can put, you know, an, an informative prior, you say, you know, put a big Gaussian over the weights and send uh, the variant to infinity, you know, in the start from some random initial deletion for the weights. But after you're done training, this is a delta, meaning that you converge to a single set of weights. So this KL divergence is infinity. And so the path bias bound tells you the expected error is smaller than the empirical error plus infinity. Thank you very much. So that's uh, that's called a vacuous bound. Okay. Now, how would we get a non vacuous here? distribution on the weights? Because there isn't one. You converse to one set of weights. Okay. And this is something that has called a great deal of confusion. There are papers on information theory of deep learning, and then they say that you compute the information of the deep networks, but then other papers say it's not possible because these are all degenerate and so on. So here's how you construct the distribution. It's not a real distribution, okay? It's a purely conceptual construction. So you converge to a set of weights, okay? Now, for those of you who have played with deep networks, these are highly overparameterized systems. And one thing you notice once you converge is that there are some weights that matter very little. So if you take those weights and change them however you want, Nothing changes. The loss, the training loss, stays the same. So you could say these weights are uninformative. Okay, you could you know replace them with noise or kill them, put them to zero, and nothing changes. Okay. On the other hand, there are some weights that if you change this a tiny little bit, all of a sudden the loss shoots up. Okay. Another way of saying is that if you compute the Hessian of the loss at convergence, you will see that the rank of the Hessian is very 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 small compared to the ambient dimension. So most of the weights carry no information. So what you can do is you can say, well, let me compute some type of second order approximation around the weight. And this will be some very high dimensional elongated Gaussian. And just think of that as the posterior distribution, okay? Not because there is a Gaussian distribution, not because you train with stochastic gradient descent and that's the noise distribution of SGD. No, nothing to do with that. You have, can have a deterministic training process or whatever training process you arrive at a point, and then at that point, you explore a little bit, and then uh, you see that there are many dimensions along which uh, you can move, and that de defines a imputed distribution, and you put a big Gaussian ball around it, okay? That's one way of doing it. There are more sophisticated ways of doing it with Kolmogor of complexity, but I won't get there. So the intuition of the Gaussian is sufficient, and it's actually a great approximation as I will show you. So what about, this thing here. Okay, so uh, it's arbitrary, 
These are two design parameters in the back base bound. If I use the most trivial, I get a vacuous bound, but they're at my disposal. I can decide what is Q and what is P. Q will be a big Gaussian centered around the points where we have converged. And if you already are familiar with the notion of Fisher information, is the covariance is the inverse of the Fisher. This P, what are we going to do with this P? Well, if I take this bound and look for the minimum with respect to all possible uh, probability distributions of P, of W, then what I get is that the minimum is reached when P of W is the marginal over all possible data sets. Okay? What it means is that you have to take all the possible data set, train your models on all of them, get a bunch of weights, and then take all these weights and average them. Okay? Obviously, it's not possible. Okay? But if you were able to do that, then uh, this KL divergence would be the Shannon mutual information between the weights and the data set, which are now both thought of as random variables. Okay? So that is the quantity that makes the pack bayes bound non-vacuous, and in fact, it's the, the tightest bound. Okay? So that's what governs generalization. And it makes sense that in order to talk about generalization, you have to look not just the data set you have, but all possible data sets, right? Because if you want to make a statement about generalization, you better understand something about the relation between all of these data sets. So Shannon says, take all the data sets in the world, train the models on all of them, and then average them, and then compute the coding length of the weights, which is what this KL divergence measures. And that's the amount of information that the weights contain about the task. Okay. I know this sounds a bit strange because we are crafting these distributions out of nowhere, and now the prior is a prior that we have no access to. Okay, so this is what we would like to do. We would like to be able to say, let's not minimize just the empirical cross entropy, but let's add this term. Think of it as a regularizer, except that we need to compute it and optimize it, and we can do neither because we don't have access to all the data sets in the world. Okay. So what is it that we can do? Well, what we can do is we can say, well, we don't know anything about the weights, so let's start with an uninformative prior, okay? Take a big Gaussian and send it to infinity. And then this KL term is related to the determinant of the trace of the Fisher information. The Fisher information takes your discriminant and computes gradient perturbation with respect to the weights, then stack them up, averages them. It's a, it's a notion of sensitivity for those of you that come from control, that tells you what weights matter uh, in terms of having an effect on the loss. So that we can compute, even in millions or hundreds of millions of parameters with some care. It's a matrix square the number of parameters. So you can imagine that if you're running a T5 model from Google at 11.5 billion parameters, this, you have to exercise a little bit of caution. So we can compute that. The problem is that that gives, in general, a vacuous bound, okay? But one of the core results that I would like to take home today is that if you manage while training to minimize the Fisher information in the weights, which you can do, the Fisher information drives the Shannon mutual information, so controls the Shannon mutual information, not in general, but for deep networks trained with stochastic linear descent. Okay, that's the core result that I would like to state later more precisely. But there's other thing that you can do. You can actually, as you are training, you can control the amount of information in the weights very easily. You don't need to compute anything nor optimize anything. You can just control it. How? You just add noise to the weights. Okay. Do you remember that junk that I said that you add to the weights in the first order optimization? That junk is noise. And the pack based bound says, yes, please, add noise, diminish, remove, okay, minimize the information in the weights, which is very counterintuitive. Okay. So the training process is not so much maximizing information about the data and put it in the weights, it's minimizing the information in the weights, so long as you retain just as much as you need to minimize the training loss. Okay. Okay, so normally the information, uh, sorry, the, the pack bayes bound is used to compute or to quantify the generalization gap. 
it says, this is your training set, this is how much error you're likely to make in the test set. But in reality, these numbers don't mean anything for deep networks because the quantity on the right just cannot be computed. However, we're not going to use the bug based bound as a number that measures the generalization error. We're going to use it as a variational principle to solve the learning problem. Okay. In other words, you give me a training problem if I know that I have minimized the information Lagrangian, which is the gentleman inside or gentle person inside the bug based bound, then I know that I've done my best. Your best may still very, be very bad because if you gave me a data set that was a billion images that are all identical, my generalization error would be terrible, but it's still the best thing I can do. Okay? So the bug based bound cannot tell you how, deep, how well you did, but it can tell you that you did your best. Okay? Questions or is this concept uh, clear? So for those of you who are familiar with some of these concepts, uh, you may recognize that uh, uh, the quantity in blue, which is called the information Lagrangian, is also related to the evidence lower bound, which is a Bayesian inference criterion when beta is equal to one. It's also related to an information bottleneck. It is in fact in the form of an information bottleneck except that it's not the information bottleneck that you read about in papers about the information bottleneck in deep learning, because this is the information bottleneck between the data set and the weights, which is completely different than the information bottleneck between the input and the output of the network. Okay. They are related, but in very non-trivial ways. Okay. So, okay. So finally, how do we define and measure the information on the weights? So, as I said, you take the, Information Lagrangian, which is this object in blue, you minimize it. And as you minimize it, it will be a function of this coefficient beta that measures the complexity cost or the encoding, the, 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 the coding length of the weights as uh, units of loss. Okay. So there's a Pareto optimal curve there, and uh, you know how much a bit of coding length is worth for you in terms of training accuracy is up to you, depends on the problem. You can choose it, you have to choose it. Okay, and then at the minimum for that particular type of beta, the coding length of the weight measures the information in the weights. Okay, obviously, if you are happy with a 50% correct classification, you may get away with very few bits, but if you want 99%, then you may have to do a lot more work and the coding length will grow, will go up. Okay. So that's how you measure information in the weights. You pick a prior P, okay, arbitrary, okay, pick a posterior Q, again, arbitrary. These are kind of your units of information. Okay. And then train at convergence measures the coding length, that's the information. And it measures in nuts, and you can compute it and plot it over time. Okay. Even in this million dimensions or billion dimensions in the dimensional landscape. Okay. So as we said, Shannon measure generalization. That's what we would like to place in here, but we don't know the prior or the posterior. Fisher is what we can compute. And in general, these two things are disjoint. One does not bound the other. However, you can show that for deep network trained with stochastic gradient descent, there is a first order approximation that shows you that if you minimize the, the fissure, okay, this becomes large, this becomes small, you also are forced to minimize the shannon. Okay. So this is an approximation up to second order that compute second order approximation computed around the weight to which your algorithm converged, doesn't matter how you got there, okay? And this is saying that if in doing that, you minimize the trace, for instance, of the Fisher information, then you also minimize the Shannon information that the weights contain about the data set. So if you want to think about it, uh, the Fisher is a measure of numerical stability or sensitivity of the solution to the particular weights. and the Shannon information is a measure of identifiability. Okay. 
And so it's intuitive that these two might be connected, but they are not in general. They're not for arbitrary parametric models with arbitrary losses. This is true for deep networks trained with SGD. Okay. Okay, so now, any questions so far? Okay, to sum it up, okay. The real, the, 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 the variational principle, the function, the right thing to optimize is not the empirical loss. It's empirical loss plus a regularizer, which is the thing that measures the information in the weights. You want to reduce the information in the weights as much as possible. Okay. All right. So now, is that what we do? No. So what we do in reality is this term is not there. What we do in reality, we just minimize the uh, empirical cross entropy and cross fingers. Okay. For the most part, there are cases where you do try to put an explicit regularizer, and I will come back to that later. Okay. So how do you reconcile this? Um, well, let me show you what happens if you plot the fission information as the number of training epochs progresses. So think of this as time, okay? You would expect that as you learn, as you transfer information from the data set to the weights, the information containing the weights grows monotonically, perhaps with some diminishing return and maybe asymptotes at some point, right? So even if you give me more data beyond a certain point, I don't learn anything new. Instead, what you observe very repeatedly for deep networks, different architecture, different data sets, different loss, and so on and so forth, is that you get a very sharp increase in information in the weights, followed by a decrease, followed by a plateau with very low information. So in a sense, you are first you are memorizing, then you are forgetting, and then you are left with a relatively low amount of information. And this is happening while the test accuracy keeps increasing. So it's not that you're forgetting, you're forgetting the stuff that doesn't matter. So it appears that this forgetting is actually an interest, an important part of learning. Okay, that's at least what I tell my wife when she complains that I forget things, I'm still learning. So uh, now, if you imagine the fission information as measuring the curvature of the loss, as the solution moves around, the solution is this elephant, moves around this landscape, what this means is that the solution, which is stochastic, goes through regions of very high curvature, which are very narrow bottlenecks, and then finds a very wide valley, very low curvature, flat minima, as they're called, uh, where it settles. Okay? So there are these bottlenecks in the residual landscape, and once you are through them, then there's a very wide valley. And even though you have no identifiability, so you could converge to a lot of different minima there, it really doesn't matter which one it is once you get there. But if you don't get into that valley, then there's then you're out of luck. Okay. And so the idea here is that because of the nature of SGD, and this is verified both empirically and theoretically, as I'll point out in the next slide, SGD by nature seeks these wide valleys, sees these flat valleys. So SGD, stochastic linear descent, looks for solutions where the fission information is low. And if the fission information is low, then the Shannon information is low. And so SGD, okay, implicitly is biased towards minimizing this term, even though that uh, regularizer is not explicitly written in your loss function, okay? So that's kind of a remarkable. So in, in the sense, Fisher really controls the learning dynamics. You can find the details in the paper. Now, you can prove this, and uh, I will not get into detail, but will point you to the two papers where it's done into different things. One is by Pratik Chaudhary, uh, where it shows is by taking SGD, and if you do physics, you like this method. So, uh, well, we we'll like both if you <laughs> like physics. So, take SGD, take it to the continuous limit, you get a stochastic different differential equation. Take the stochastic differential equation, look at the evolution of the conditional density that defines a Fokker Planck operator. That Fokker Planck operator corresponds to an energy. That energy relative to the Wasserstein distance corresponds to uh, a, a loss function. And that loss function, you would expect it to be the one you started with, but it's not. It's the one you started with, which is the cross entropy loss plus an entropic term. And that entropic term is exactly the information in the weights. Okay. 
if you didn't understand the past uh, 30 seconds, no matter. There's another way of doing it, which doesn't require you to go into the continuous limit because some people say, well, you know, what, what is this analysis? Taking STD to the continuous limit doesn't make sense because it's discrete anyway. Okay, so what uh, Alessandra Kill and Glenn Bang did uh, is they actually computed the probability over paths from any initial point W0 at time T0 to any final point WF at time TF in the space of learning tasks. This is a massive set of calculations that uses Feynman's uh, path integral approximation. But they did compute this, this uh, quantity. And what they showed is that uh, what, is go what governs it is an effective potential. And that effective potential has a term, which is the loss, and then has a drag term that depends on the fissure. Okay. Now, that also shows this factor here, which you would like to be one, but it's not. Okay. And that will come back later in surprising ways. Okay. Okay. So what I talked so far is I talked about ways of controlling information during the training process of a deep network. I studied for classification, but many of the ideas generalize where you can control the optimization by injecting noise. You can control regularization by putting there a regularizer that minimizes the information uh, in the weights. And SGD already does that for you implicitly. Or you can do it yourself by minimizing some other criterion. For instance, I will, uh, I will show later the typical examples in deep learning are weight decay, where you minimize the norm of the weights. But also, you can regularize by adding data that have the type of variability that you would like to sample. This is called data augmentation. Again, it's a common practice. So let me talk about these two aspects. So in weight decay, you take the empirical loss and then you add the norm of the weights. So you try to make the weights small. Now that's not an information criterion, so, but you know, it's an upper bound, it's a very loose upper bound. It's very common practice, it's easy, okay? So now, those of you who are familiar with regularization, the way we think about regularization, we think of a very non-convex landscape, and then we add a function that smooths the landscape locally around the minimum, so that you know the solution doesn't get trapped in local minima. So you think of a one-parameter family, parameter beta here, defines an homotopy of, of functions, and you start with minimizing the smooth one, and then gradually you anneal it to the original loss. Uh, this is the Tikhonov of view of regularization, and this is completely not the case in deep learning, okay? So I'll argue that with an experiment. So you can take a deep network and you can train it with weight decay for a certain number of epochs. And then you switch off the regularizer and uh, put beta to zero. And from that point on, you train unregularized. So the loss function at convergence here in all these experiments is completely unregularized. So if the loss function was very messy around the minimum, all those local extremes are still there. And so what you notice here is that if you move the regularizer after a certain number of epochs, let's say 75 or 100, you get to the same, well, not the same solution, but a solution which is equally good, right? Whether or not the final, the asymptotic, loss is regularized, okay? So in other words, you can switch off the regularizer at some point and there's no difference. So clearly the mechanism of action is not to smooth out the loss function, okay? So this was a bit surprising to us. And so it seems that uh, regularization doesn't act by smoothing the loss function, but acts by trying to put you into the right bottleneck at the beginning, okay? So let's do the opposite experiment where we start unregularized, and then we switch on the regularizer after a certain number of epochs, for instance, 25, 50, and so on and so forth. And again, what you see is that if you switch on the regularizer too late, okay, and by then you haven't gotten into the right loss, you can, even if you're regularized, you never converge to the uh, target um, accuracy, okay? So clearly there's stuff going on here where all the action of the regularization happens in the transit, in the early phases of learning, okay? Yet most of the theory uh, for these machines is asymptotic. So there's a lot of need 
to understand the transient dynamics of learning. Now, some people ask, is it because the solution is stuck in local minimum? No, it's not, because even after you switch the regularizer on and off, the solution moves quite a bit. Okay, so it's not just everything is still because we are near the training, the, the learning rate to zero, and then everything is stuck. No, things move. Okay. Now, uh, you may remember this picture where we said that empirically we observe that information goes up and then comes down, and that corresponds to going through this through these bottlenecks. And so it turns out that if you don't let the system go through these bottlenecks, okay, so for instance, by maintaining the learning rate high here, then you never get into the white valley and then you never get good generalization. So it seems that even though the final information in the weight is very small, the network has to first memorize and then distill or digest that information. Okay, so I've kind of introduced a number of, of concepts, and now the question that is on people's mind is, well, okay, great, what do you do with it? You know, how is this useful? So I want to point to at least one uh, real application of this, which is in computing the distance between learning tasks. Okay, so let's say you train a network on a certain data set. Typically these days for computer vision, there's ImageNet, which has a thousand categories, millions of images. You pre-train that. And now somebody comes with a different task and says, okay, but now I want you to drive your car, I want you to you know, uh, detect uh, tumors in a mammogram or whatever. And so people typically start with that pre-trained model as initial condition, which is one point in the space of the learning task, and then tries to navigate to a different point, okay, which is called fine tuning by modifying the network. Now, if you do it a million times and you have a million pre-trained model, and now I come with my task, which is to you know, classify faucets, and you've never seen a faucet before, the question is, what is the task that I've learned before that is closest to me? So I can start there, right? So you really want to compute distance between them in tasks. Okay. So we really saw that the data set is not a good way of comparing tasks, the weights also, because you're in millions of dimensions. So really what you care for is the information, both in the weights and in the data set. That's what the task means. Now we know how to compute it. So what you do is you compute the information you need to jointly learn the two tasks, minus the information you needed to solve one. And this can be computed without trying, without actually training it, by having a small probe network that computes the feature information for the joint task and the feature information for the single task. And the difference is the distance. It's asymmetric because if you learn a complex task, it's very easy to go to a easy task than the other way around. So this is an asymmetric distance, as it should be. And so you can see it here that if you learn, for instance, uh, CIFAR, then it's uh, very easy to learn. Uh, you know, uh, so you can see that this matrix, which is the pairwise distances, is asymmetric. So it's, if you go from easy to difficult, you get um, small distances. If you go difficult to easy, sorry, large distances. If you go uh, difficult to easy, you get small distances. And this has been done in large scale with thousands of tasks and uh, is used uh, at scale for uh, selection of uh, pre-trained models in a model zoo or experts, okay? All right, there's a little bit of a problem. So we have a few more minutes left. So I wanna point that to you because it's uh, completely open. So I said, mentioned earlier that we really want to go from one task to another and the task distance measures how, diff how close two tasks are. Except that two tasks being closed doesn't mean that you can go from one to the other. So the notion of task reachability that I mentioned at the beginning is not captured by just the notion of task distance. Okay. So how do I know if a task is reachable? Okay. And so the picture here is from a movie, it's Carraldo, where Klaus Kinski uh, has a boat that is in a river in the Amazon. And uh, there's a river nearby that connects to Manaus, where he wants to get to because of, there's an inauguration of the opera house in Manaus. And so he decides to have his crew take the boat from one river to the other by going through a mountain, okay? And that doesn't go very well. And so what happens here is similar that we have tasks that are very similar to each other, yet there is no high probability path between them. So how do we capture that, okay? So now you may remember that little pesky factor that I had in the in the probability over paths from one task to another. That is where that comes back. And it comes back in very interesting ways. So 
Uh, let me point to some experiments that date back to the late 50s, early 60s, when uh, Hubel and Wiesel were studying the human visual system, uh, the, the visual system. And so they took cats that had a visual defect. So uh, when they were born, they had congenital cataracts. So they saw blurry, they saw the world blurry. And then after a certain number of days, they removed the deficit. So they removed the cataract. And then the cat was free to roam around. And what they noticed is that if you remove the deficit early, then the cat eventually develops normal vision. But if you wait too long to remove the deficit, no matter how much time the cat has to learn, it will never develop a normal vision. These are called critical learning periods. And they're shared among many different skills and different species. Uh, you know, uh, my son was born with uh, uh, myopia. And so if we hadn't noticed early, we would, would have not corrected him and now he would be amblyopic. And this is why you cannot teach an old dog new tricks and so on and so forth. So the explanation for this in biology is biochemical. You know, you have neural plasticity decreases, you get old and you cannot learn new tricks. But in fact, here's what happens when you look at the final performance in visual acuity of a cat as you remove this, the deficit after one, two, three, 100, 200 days. And this is the accuracy in the normal cat. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that neural networks are like biological systems, not at all. But neural networks exhibit critical uh, learning period phenomena just as well. So this is the accuracy of a deep, uh, ResNet 18 network, train, ResNet 50 train on CIFAR, as you change from a slightly blurry data set to the normal data set after 20, 40, 50 epochs. And this is the accuracy that's achieved. So it's a bit puzzling because neural networks don't age. They don't have neural plasticity. Connectivity is fixed. So why would they exhibit critical learning period? Okay. And now if you plot the same thing, but instead of cumulative, you look at the sensitivity, which is how much damage do you make, do you get if you apply a deficit over a window at different times? This is the sensitivity curve for the cat, and this is a sensitivity curve for the network. And you might remember the plot of deficient information in the weights. These things live into different space, but if you overlap them, different units, so you have to rescale them, they look remarkably similar. So it really looks like there's a lot going on in the transit to be understood, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, and during the transit, information is plastic, so it moves, and now we know how to compute it, we can actually plot it as a function of time. It uh, switches and goes from different layers, different weights, and so on and so forth. And after, if you correct the deficit too late, then it doesn't move anymore. Okay, so last concept I would like to introduce is uh, I argued uh, that the space of learning task, if you start from random, is, is very complex, but at some point you find a bottleneck, you make it through it, and at that point, there's a wide valley and there's many possible solutions there. So if it's a benign landscape, once you get into that uh, valley, might it be that if we just linearize the model, okay, now we have a linear model. So we take the network, which is a very highly dimensional nonlinear function, and we take the, the final point of convergence, and then we linearize around that, and then we obtain another family of networks with a new set of parameters. Might it be that this network uh, is just as good in the sense that you can get to tasks that you would get to even by optimizing the original network. So is non-linear fine-tuning that you use for going from A to B just as good as linearized fine-tuning inside the valley? So people have tried to do that and it doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't work very well. So yes, you can move a little bit with these uh, linearized networks, but not very effective. However, uh, what Alessandro Aquila has shown here is that if instead of using the cross entropy loss, you use the least squares error, okay, and if you precondition with the inverse of the Fisher information using Kronecker factorization, and if instead of ReLU, which is one of the modules of this network, you look leaky ReLU, then you achieve results which are comparable and in some cases even better than nonlinear uh, fine tuning. Okay, so all of these concepts were already introduced, but never put together somehow, but putting them together really uh, helps you solve problems, especially when you don't have a lot of training data for fine tuning. Okay, so this linear quadratic fine tuning is just 
you solve a linear convex optimization problem, a linear quadratic optimization problem, and you get results which are as good, in some case better, than a big gigantic nonlinear optimization locally. All right, so I'm done in the one minute I have left. Let me just summarize the concepts that I introduced. So I introduced the notion, notion of task reachability, which captures whether or not you're able to go from one task, which is represented by a set of weights in a parametric model, to another task in the side dimensional highly convex landscape. That allowed us to define a distance between tasks, an asymmetric distance between tasks, so we can measure how far they are. These notions stem from the information Lagrangian, which is a variational principle that we want to optimize, which is related to a lot of uh, concepts, but not quite any of them in machine learning. And really, the novelty here is being able to measure these quantities, minimize them, and even in some cases, control them. And then you see these two phenomena where you have near the transient, you have very highly complex dynamics and nonlinearities, non convexities. And then once you get into a flat landscape, then you can linearize everything and you do just as well. And linear quadratic fine tune is a recent uh, uh, paper that we put on. Okay. All right. Uh, I Okay, yeah, so thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions if, uh, if you have any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefano. If you have a question, uh, a short question, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and directly ask Stefano. Before that, I have a quick question. So uh, as you said, a stochastic gradient is implicitly improving generalization, but there's no free lunch. Uh, so could you have a comment on the robustness? Like see, we perturb the W a little bit or we perturb the X a little bit. Yeah, um, that's excellent. So uh, the robustness, and so robustness means different things. Robustness of what with respect to what? I assume that you mean robustness with respect to perturbations in the parameters or respect to perturbations in the inputs. Because when people talk about, for instance, adversarial perturbations, these are small perturbations you apply to the input that completely screw up your inference downstream, right? And these are typically things that take you out of distribution. That's a different talk. <laughs> so. I will not get to it, but, uh, but uh, they're very related in the sense that in the first layer, perturbations on the inputs are dual to perturbations in the parameters because they interact linearly in the first layer, right? And perturbations of the weights are minimized if you minimize the trace of the Fisher information because in the pack based bound, you get the inverse of the Fisher and uh, that measures the sensitivity of the model with respect to perturbations in the parameters. So you actually minimize the sensitivity to perturbations or maximize robustness to perturbations of the time. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks. Uh, Hazan, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, have you, this is a really nice talk. Have you thought about connecting this to the double descent phenomena that uh, people talk okay. about? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there are some connections, but they're still being explored. So you're talking about uh, uh, Misha Belkin's. Uh, Double descent. So, so there are some connections, but uh, not completely worked out yet. So I prefer to not to speculate. I think it's really cool in uh, connecting the data set uh, and complexity instead of the model complexity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, since we are a bit over time, let's have the last uh, quick question. Uh, Okay. I, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for the uh, great talk. So I have a quick question. So could you like explain, it's more like a clarification. So could you explain a little bit why we see the facial information like along the training process, why the facial information in initially increase and then like, you, you, since I feel the connection is really good, you mentioned it's memorizing and then it's forgetting and then it's keep stable. But I kind of, I don't get why like we see such phenomena. Yeah, so uh, to be honest, uh, I don't have a, a, a super compelling explanation. So this is a phenomenon that we observe empirically. So why does the Fisher information first go up and then comes down? Uh, this has been observed empirically. So Naftali Tishby, who's the inventor of the uh, information bottlenecks, talks about the memorization phase and the consolidation phase. If you talk to biologists, they tell you, oh, of course, it's obvious that there's first an information gathering and then a consolidation phase, and then you forget, and forgetting is good, and so on and so forth. 
from an information st processing standpoint, forgetting doesn't seem like a good idea. In fact, one of my mentors, uh, uh, Don Snyder, used to say that his mother told him to never throw away information. And yet it looks like uh, the network is actively throwing away information. So what's the point? Why doesn't it go monotonically from here to there? So uh, I don't have a good answer. This is part of what I say when I say that uh, there's a lot to be understood about the transient behavior. Why do we need to go to these bottlenecks? So uh, Alessandro Aquila has a lot of very interesting intuitions, but I don't want to... Um, uh, Feel free to reach out to him, and uh, and he will give you a lot of uh, very nice insights and intuition. But I don't have a strong, uh, strong explanation for that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but this phenomenon is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and Naftali Tishbi was the first to observe it. Uh, his plots are slightly different, but he did does talk about this memorization and consolidation phase. Only that he talks about information in the activations. And there's controversy as to whether that is meaningful because it's a deterministic function. There's no uncertainty in a certainty due to quantization. So here, this is uh, this is uh, uh, formally well defined and computable, and you can compute it as a function of time. So it doesn't have the same uh, the same shortcomings as the activation. Yeah. 